Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here once again with another report on my adventures into my forgotten computer shed. After my success in getting the Packard Bell 386SX to come back to life, I decided to turn my attention toward another forgotten system that was lingering out in the shed. In this case, a rather generic looking desktop cased IBM personal computer clone. Powered by an AMD AM486 DX4 100 MHz 486 class microprocessor resting on a rather generic board. In fact, a board that is so generic it has no maker name on it, it has no model name on it. The only thing that it has over in the corner by the keyboard connection is a printed circuit board revision number, version 6.1. Beyond that, there's not much to identify this board by because it simply doesn't say much about where it came from or even what it is. The only thing that it's even halfway affirmative about is that it seemingly has a right back cache. A fact that we are assured of not only on these cache chips but also on a sticker attached to the chipset. And that sticker when peeled up was not very revealing as to who actually manufactured the core logic used in this system. There's a simple three digit code printed on the chip and that's it, and I found nothing online to go on. Now as many of you who play around with old computer crap on a regular basis will know, sometimes working with and reviving this equipment is nothing less than a labor of love. And that was definitely the truth with this system. It's certainly not unheard of, especially for forgotten and neglected equipment, to have it suddenly start working. What in the world? I move the seat and the radio starts working. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was not the case with this system. This computer was given to me about five or six years ago. Its previous owners were completely exasperated with it. In fact, if I had not taken it out of their home at the time, they assured me that it was going to be smashed. I decided that whatever was wrong with it, being the eternally hopeful type, that I could probably take it home and get it fixed. Well, life happened, it ended up in the computer shed, and here it is today, about five or six years later, finally getting the attention it deserves. At first, things were not looking too promising. The power supply powered up and worked, and its voltages seemed to be pretty much right on on the 5 and 12 volt side, both negative and positive alike, but the power supply fan was running very slowly, and there wasn't even a flicker or a glimmer of life from the motherboard. No post beeps, no video flashes, the only thing that gave it away that it might even be getting power was the fact that some of the chips, including the microprocessor sitting there, were getting warm after the power had been on for a few moments. So I started to troubleshoot the system. One of the first things that I found, I'll go ahead and unplug the floppy drive cable here, I found a dead CMOS clock battery. Thankfully this motherboard uses a CR2032, and while the CR2032 batteries can leak the same as their nickel metal hydride and nickel cadmium counterparts, they're not as prone to it. It really takes a fairly serious amount of neglect to get those batteries leaking. Since I didn't know if this board would spring to life or not, I took a battery off of a dead motherboard that still had some charge left in it. And as it turned out, it was sufficient to get the system to hold its settings and the time and date. Then I turned my attention to the memory. This motherboard, as you can see, is something of a stepping stone between the newer 72-pin fast page mode sims and the old 30-pin sims. The previous owners had decided that they would populate every one of the sim sockets, not only the 30-pin, but also the 72-pin. No two types of memory in this system matched, and as far as I know, it's illegal to populate both the 30 and 72-pin sim slots. You have to choose which type of memory you're going to use. I have never seen a motherboard that worked another way or that could accept multiple differing types of memory all at the same time. The method of motherboard installation in this case is nothing less than very novel as well. If you look carefully you can kind of see that the board is skewed. It's not straight against the back of the case like it ought to be. And in fact there is some skew back here that puts a little bit of pressure on both the video and the multiple I.O. card. That's because this board has been installed not with the proper screws and occasional plastic standoff but plastic standoffs all the way. There's one over there. There's one over here in between 
the video and I.O. card, which you can just barely see to the right-hand side of that socketed ROM chip. There's another one down here. There's one in the center someplace. In fact, the only place that this board is held in with a screw is right there between those two ISA slots. That's the only screw and spacer assembly that were used on this motherboard. And while it worked, it's not really the right way to do it. So I started out by removing the motherboard and all the cards, and I cleaned the motherboard. Then I put it back into its case, and I decided to simplify the memory configuration. After that point, the board finally started to struggle and stumble to come back to life. It started issuing post beep codes. Now this is an AMI BIOS based system, so the beep codes are much simpler than the sets that are used by the old Packard Bell 386SX machine over there. This machine was issuing two sets of codes, and at first I thought that they were both unique codes. There was a fast paced set of two beeps, then there was a fast paced set of eight beeps. Well, I thought the two beep code indicated that something was wrong, so it's the code I looked up first, and it indicates a fault in the first 64 kilobytes of memory. No matter what SIM I used, the system would not stop issuing the two beep code. I was just about to give up hope on it when I decided, well, I'll go ahead and solve the video code if I at all can. I went ahead and I pulled this machine's video adapter out, and I installed a simple ISA VGA card. At that point, the system finally came to life with this one SIM in it and the ISA video card. It was then that I started looking a lot closer at the condition of the cards in this system. What I soon found was that there was corrosion on the fingers of this VL bus video card. So I took it out and I scrubbed the contacts very carefully with a sheet of copy paper and a pencil eraser. I eventually got all the corrosion to come off, I resocketed the video card, and the system's video once again was restored to functionality. Then the multi-IO board didn't work, and you guessed it, more of the same. So now the system is basically functional on the hardware front. That brings us to software, and oh boy, the story just keeps getting better. I think the best way to start explaining the true magnitude of the software screw-ups on this system is to simply start the machine and let it begin to demonstrate. After that, I will take over and fill in with some additional explanations. So let's go ahead and power things up here. One very interesting thing about this system is that it initializes and starts doing the power on self-test so quickly that this Samsung SyncMaster 512 flat panel over here doesn't initialize until the power on self-test has basically completely concluded. You will actually hear a fast-paced set of beeps as this thing runs through its memory test, and it's only toward the end of that test that the monitor actually comes to life. So listen carefully and you can probably hear them. And there finally, now that the memory test has concluded, is the conclusion of the power on self test. As you can see, someone was attempting to install Windows 95 on this computer, only it went horribly, horribly wrong. There are all kinds of problems here. There's file system corruption. I know that because I checked it out earlier. There's also a number of missing and corrupted files. The high memory system driver, the Windows executable to actually start Windows running from a command prompt, is missing or damaged, and there are a lot more serious problems than that, as hinted by this message down here that says file creation error. So what went so horribly wrong here? Well, I'll go ahead and run the FDisk hard drive configuration utility and show you what the problem is. If we go in here and display partition information, the computer will show us exactly how the hard drive has been laid out. And everything up here is so far so good. We have a partition C. It is active. It was originally prepared for use probably under MS-DOS 5 and nobody just ever bothered to change the volume label. It is 1.2 gigabytes in size and it utilizes the FAT16 file system. So what's the problem? The problem is down here and it's one of disk geometry. The disk geometry is not being accurately presented to the operating system by the system BIOS. As you can see down here, even though the partition is reported to be 1.2 gigabytes in size, the system only sees a drive that is 504 megabytes in size. When there is a mismatch like that, things go pretty seriously wrong. 
especially if the partition is indicated to be larger than the geometry representation to the operating system can possibly allow for. So let's go ahead and reset the computer here and I'll go into the system setup utility and show you where the original owners of this computer went wrong. Now this particular system is using an AMI BIOS as previously mentioned and there's something very interesting about this BIOS as you have no doubt very quickly noticed from the setup utility. It's running in a sort of graphical mode. American Megatrends referred to this as the Win BIOS, and while it was very popular in the mid-1990s, especially on 486 systems, it also saw some use on some early e-machines models around the Socket 370 era. They have this same setup utility. And it's a little superfluous. For example, there's things in here that you wouldn't really need to do, such as changing the color set. I suppose the color set that I'm about to choose would cause some to cast doubts on my masculinity, but so what? I like the colors, and it's my video, and it's my channel, and it's my computer, so I can do whatever the heck I want with it. With that little change made, let's go in here. Everything is configured through these icons, which are navigated entirely using the keyboard. This program does recognize both serial and PS2 port mice. I don't have one hooked up at the moment, so all I can do is drive it through the keyboard. Fortunately, it is extremely possible to do that, which is a very good thing. The standard area simply covers the machine's basic configuration, such as the current date and time, as you can see displayed right there. It also allows you to configure other things, such as the master and slave hard drives, as well as the A and B floppy drives. And you can see, I don't know if the I.O. controller on this system is up to it, but the BIOS has support for the 2.88 megabyte drive type. But what we want to adjust is not in there, so let's go into the advanced area and have a look around. This hard drive is big enough that it needs a translation method to accurately describe its geometry to many operating systems, and that is known as logical block addressing. And as you can see here, if we go down far enough, the logical block addressing mode is completely disabled. So the drive's geometry is not being appropriately reported to the operating system, and it actually needs to be enabled. I, I should go ahead and just set it to the master device, but it won't hurt anything to have it enabled for the master and slave devices on the primary IDE channel in case I have to configure another IDE drive of some kind, or I desire to add another hard drive to this system at some point. Then it'll be set, and I won't even have to think about it. And furthermore, it shouldn't make a difference to an older hard drive whose size is not sufficient to need help from logical block addressing translation. So with that change made, I can go ahead and break out of the system setup program here, and as proof that the representation of the disk geometry has now changed, you'll notice that when the power on self-test concludes, the system can no longer boot properly. So I will have to go in and I will have to repartition the disk, reformat it just to be on the safe side, and then reinstall the system files. My ultimate plan for this system, since it's in good working order otherwise, is probably to turn it into something of a fun DOS games machine. The reason being that this thing has a genuine Creative Sound Blaster AWE64 board in it, as well as adjustable computer speeds. You can see that when I press the turbo button, not only will the turbo LED illuminate, the system display will also change to indicate that the machine is now clocked at 100 megahertz. I'm not sure that the turbo button is actually working, because the system is reporting a 100 megahertz CPU clock even when the turbo function is allegedly turned off. But again, I think this machine could serve very well as a fun little place to play DOS games on. It just needs a good cleaning up, and there will certainly be more videos about it in the future. Thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.